We're getting back to our series in Acts. Last Sunday night, we took a look at our theme in 1 Thessalonians 3 and 4, Thrive in the Pursuit of Love, was the message. We saw that God works in us to thrive in love, so thrive in holiness and love. If you weren't able to be here, it's posted, but also encourage you just to go read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 12, and take a listen or take a read of it for a refresher. We're getting back to Acts, and I want us to see the big picture tonight as we do that. We're in a series, His Mission, meaning Jesus' mission, is our mission. His mission, our mission. And this is sermon number 20, actually, in that series. And so Acts, coupled with the Gospel of Luke. So you have the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, pull Luke out of there. You have the Gospel of Luke, and then you have Acts. It is a two-part volume from Luke who was a doctor, a believer in Jesus Christ, a doctor, traveled with the Apostle Paul, and had a lot of information about all the early happenings, a lot of information about Jesus' life from eyewitness sources, but also about the early days of the church and the apostles. And so he had wrote this two-part volume to a man named Theophilus. In the Gospel of Luke, it basically defined clearly the life, which is a large portion of it, builds up to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that then meant to the world. And then, of course, Acts records the actions. Acts, right? Amen? You understand the actions, the acts of Christ's apostles, the sent ones and the disciples who made up the early churches. So Luke began this record back in Acts chapter 1. He began this record of the acts of the apostles by stating this that the first document he's referencing the gospel, the first document or the former treatise, or however that's pronounced, um, the, but that means the first document I made of all Jesus began both to do and teach. So the first document he wrote, the gospel of Luke, was a record that reveals what Jesus did and taught all the way up to the day he was taken up in the clouds, not to be seen of his disciples anymore. Now notice he said what he began to do. And what he began to do is still going on today. Uh, it still was going on through the apostles and the churches. His ascension back to heaven did not come before he did two things. So before he ascended, two things happened. One, he gave commandments to his chosen apostles, which how many were there at that point? Eleven. Eleven at that point. Uh, Judas had, uh, had uh, already uh, hung himself. And so there were eleven at that point. He gave commandments to them, but he also, for 40 days, he proved to his apostles that he was alive, and he spoke of the things that have to do with the kingdom of God. So for 40 days, he gave them proof he was alive. This, this isn't something, just fairy tale stuff. This is solid. You can sink your teeth into it, stand upon it. So what became increasingly clear as one reads, or what becomes increasingly clear as one reads and reflects on the gospel according to Luke and then the Acts of the Apostles is this. That the mission that Jesus Christ owned as His to do His Father's will, to reconcile lost sinners to God, to bring them together, His mission is the very mission that He gave His apostles to do, and by extension, the disciples and churches that would spring up as a result of the apostles doing Christ's mission. So truly, Jesus' mission became our mission. You're here today because you heard of the gospel because someone, a part of a church, in a long history, in a long line of churches, someone told you the gospel. We are called now. It's our mission. It's our turn. We are called to reconcile lost sinners unto God. Do You have two people at odds. We're bringing them back into agreement. And we can only do this by doing what the apostles, the disciples, and the churches did in Acts. You say, well, what did they do? Well, in summary... They first waited on God to fulfill His promise to give them His Spirit. And they continued in prayer. And then they appointed necessary men to witness with them of Jesus. And in the power of God's Spirit, they preached the good news of Christ's death and resurrection and that the Jews needed to repent. They offered peace with God. Forgiveness of sins to those who would believe the gospel. They faced dangerous 
mounting opposition, yet remained steadfast. The apostles healed people in the power of Jesus' name. Jesus gave them that power to do that. Disciples crossed cultural barriers with the name of Christ. Disciples embraced enemies who had repented unto faith in Jesus. In short, the apostles, the disciples, the early churches did what Jesus wanted them to do. No matter what it cost them or where it took them. This is what they thought. Jesus' mission is our mission, no matter our circumstances. It's our mission, no matter our circumstances. So once again, I feel confident that Christ's sufficient word touches our, our circumstances to show us his mission is still our mission too, regardless of our circumstances. You're in Acts chapter 9. I want to invite your attention to verse 32. And it came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters, throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelled at Lydda and Saron, which was the region surrounding that, uh, Saron, so if you look at a map and you have Jerusalem right here and the Mediterranean Sea's over here, Lydda was somewhere about here and there was a region between Lydda and Joppa on the seacoast, which we'll read about Joppa here in a second, that the plain, that region was called Saron. So when this man was healed, all that dwell at Lydda, in that town, that city, in Saran, that region, they saw him and turned to the Lord. Quite an impact on that community. Now there was at Joppa, on the seacoast of the Mediterranean, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Now get all of the heebie-jeebies out of your system. When I was eight, I laughed at that name too. Get it out now. Okay. Tabitha, by interpretation, is called Dorcas. Tabitha was her, Amer uh, her American name. No, her uh, Chaldean Aramaic name. Okay, her Jewish name. Then Dorcas would have been the Greek name. The Greek name. So there was a mixed people there along the sea coast in that city. Her name is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there and Lydda, not too far, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber where, where Tabitha's body was. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which, and they called her this, which Dorcas made. So I'm assuming these were Greek-speaking widows. While she was with them, she made them these things and they're mourning her death. But Peter put them all forth. He put them out of the upper chamber and he kneeled down and he prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, come on, come on, he presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So you have here the Apostle Peter making his rounds to the saints throughout Judea. He found a sick man and Jesus Christ made him whole. And in a nearby sea city, a godly woman, a real disciple, got sick and died. And Peter, at the request of other disciples there, went to her and prayed and raised her from the dead. On both occasions, it was the cause of many people in those communities turning and believing in the Lord. His mission is still our mission. And there might be sickness in the lives of people around us that we're not sure we can help. Disciples of our own may get sick and may die. 
Yet, in sickness and in death, Jesus is still enough. That's our message tonight. In sickness and in death, Jesus is still enough. If you want to be reminded of the effects of sickness and death on our people, you look no further than our weekly prayer guide or the circumstances surrounding us. We use this on Wednesdays to move, or, or not to move, to more or less highlight new requests or update old ones. And I personally want to do better at praying through these requests and leading us to do so faithfully on Wednesdays. And prayer is so vital, it's so powerful. It's like the quote that I included on our Disciple Fellowship handout last week, that prayer can do anything God can do. It's just not many of us believe that. Prayer can do anything God can do. It's just not many of us believe that. But when it comes to the effect of sin and death, if you take a look at last week's prayer guide, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. There were two requests from one person affected by both sickness and death. Miss Stephanie requested prayer for her surgery, which she had this past Tuesday. She's recovering and doing well. They're taking care of her and glad to see uh, Chris and Kylie did a great job tonight. Thank you for being here. But had that request in her own life, a surgery, and now recovering. But she also made mention of an individual who was listed, and he's highlighted last week, Roger Green. Who is this, your relative or hers? Her relative. Her stepdad. Who is on our health list, but also she requested prayer for him because a grandson of his passed away recently and they're not sure about the salvation of that family. And so there are the effects of sickness and death right there. You don't even have to go to the prayer guide to feel this. I took the time to think through the members of our church and how sickness and death is affecting them. And as I went through the list, this is what I found. Older saints struggling with dementia or fighting through rehabilitation. Children caring for aging parents while fighting their own health battles. Mental health struggles. Recoveries from surgery. Chronic illness and pain. Cancer. Parents mourning deceased children, siblings mourning deceased siblings, children mourning deceased parents, elder saints who are ready to go home to heaven themselves, saints with heart issues, diabetes, anxiety, sleeplessness due to pain, vertigo, nausea, polio and lingering effects from strokes, siblings with health struggles, sickness and death affect us, all of us. We must not be surprised by this, the prosperity gospel which claims you follow God and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and well-liked. It sounds good, but it isn't biblically true or in the experience of disciples who actually do follow Jesus, it's not true. Sickness and death affect us. We're affected because we still live in this broken, sin-cursed world. And because of that fact, we're not the only ones affected by the hurts and aches and griefs of sickness and death. The world around us is greatly affected in sickness and death. And I say greatly because they're more affected than us. Because the vast majority of people out there who do not have Christ in their soul to give real hope and pain and loss, that affects them on a deeper level than it affects you and I because they do not have hope. We know Christ, they do not. We have hope, they don't. Yet gloriously, what is true for us is true for them. In sickness and in death, Jesus is enough. In sickness and in death, Jesus is enough. This account of Peter's actions as an apostle of Jesus Christ, again, highlight this reality. And you may offer a couple objections tonight. You may start with, well, Peter was an apostle. And the miracles he performed in Jesus' name aren't works I can do. And you're right, you can't. You are right, you're not an apostle. There's none that exist on earth, contrary to what some believe. You had to have been with Jesus from the baptism of John and seen all he did. That was the standard they selected, a a replacement for Judas in Acts chapter 1. Have you ever met anybody who was there when John was baptizing at the River Jordan? I'd like to meet him. Apostles don't exist anymore, and so you're not one. And Jesus Christ hasn't given disciples since then the power he gave the apostles. Are you with me? We can bear that out in Scripture. We're not going to take the time to do that tonight. But I'll say this. While we do not put God in a box and say that what he did in Acts he can't do or won't do or doesn't do anymore, I don't think we should say that. He's God. 
So if he wants to do something, he can. And he doesn't ask permission from you or me. It's like the two hunters up in the, up in the tree stand with each other. And the sun comes up in the morning. The birds are on the move. Beautiful scene. One turns the other and says, if that tells me anything, there's a God and you ain't him. There's a God and you're not him. Don't put God in a box. But on the other side of that history, hear me, it's littered with believers in Christ who suffered and died just like Christ did. So while God can do anything, He doesn't always do everything. He could. And all of it, in all of it, we believe this, He sovereignly works all things out for our good. And what is made clear in Romans chapter 8 is that our good is our final resurrection with Jesus, which could be very soon. Could be tonight. That could all take place and it could all be settled. That is our hope. Any moment, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes, we want to do the work of the gospel. Yes, we want to proclaim the good news. Our hearts are burdened for those who don't know Jesus, but our hearts yearn for the day when we see him face to face and his resurrection is known fully by us and those we dearly miss. He is sovereignly working and that is our hope. So you say, if we're not apostles... If we don't see miracles like this uh, much, or if God allows sickness and death, what does it mean for us that Jesus is enough in sickness and death? How can we apply this? Well, we're going to walk back through these miraculous accounts and see what it means. Before we address the miracles themselves, two things to help us understand them. I want you to look back at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 quickly. Look back at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus, of course, was giving some information to his disciples here. They were asking him about when he was going to restore the kingdom. Their mind was on the kingdom, the physical, the tangible uh, kingdom of God. But Jesus said, that's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father hath put in his own power. That's not for you to know what he's going to do, but I'll tell you what's going to happen with you. You, he says, shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You're going to get power. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. It's not going to be your power. It has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the Holy Ghost. And you're going to get power. And this is what you're going to be. You're going to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, the region surrounding Jerusalem, and Samaria, the region to the north, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Jesus' instructions to the apostles was, you're going to be witnesses of my name, starting in Jerusalem. And it's going to be like you. It's going to be like that ripple effect where you throw the rock and here we go it goes out this way and the the name of Christ is going to spread and you're going to be witnesses of me and and the second thing I want you to notice is that the church did what Jesus did initially in Jerusalem when the spirit came but it was not until suffering and persecution happened that they went to Judea and Samaria and began their journey to the uttermost part of the earth Stephen's death happened. Saul's madness against the church is what propelled the gospel to Samaria and the coast of Judea. The apostles, the disciples in the early churches, they spread the name of Jesus according to his words, like he said to do, and through suffering and death. And because of the persecution we've been studying, because of it, not in spite of it, because of it, saints dwelt in Lydda and Joppa. Saints that Peter would go see lived there because of the persecution. Peter would have had, listen, in those communities that did not yet hear the name of Jesus, there would have been no saints there for Peter to visit, no disciples to visit in all quarters of Judea unless the persecution had happened. But it did. Disciples scattered and they took Jesus' name with them. And new communities got to hear his name. Mentioned Don Sis this morning in his 10 principles for biblical living. He's made a statement that went like this. All circumstances of our life are God filtered. He said if you take a piece of paper and you draw a dot on the piece of paper. And then you draw a circle surrounding that dot. Or here I guess I'll do it this way. Draw a circle surrounding that dot. And there's the dot. We are the dot. And God is the circle. And everything that comes to the dot. Everything that comes to our life is first filtered through God. It's first filtered through our sovereign king. He filters circumstances and accomplishes his good purposes. That's what he does. You, you read about Job. We see this in scripture. You read about Job and you see that Satan had to have permission to 
to, to mess with Job. You read about God's own son, Jesus, who it was the, according to God's determined counsel and foreknowledge that those wicked men got a hold of his son. Here's his son submitted to his father's will. And here's his father allowing those things to happen for the salvation of us all. God allows nothing in your life that isn't going to be for your good and his glory. All things do work together for good to you who love God. And he filters every single circumstance that comes your way. So what did he accomplish then through Peter and Lydda? Well, when Peter visited the saints who lived in Lydda, he found a long-term paralytic who had a difficult circumstance. His name was Aeneas. He was bedridden eight years with paralysis. Imagine all you've done the last eight years. I was a college student eight years ago. I did a lot of fun stuff. I worked a lot. Worked at a lumber yard. Uh, I was in school a lot. Full-time student. Played basketball and other sports. I tubed on a river. That was a lot of fun. We uh, tubed in Texas, tubed a lower river. Were low spots you had to kind of you know, scoot your way down. Finally, we got smart and found a better river, paid a little more for it, but it was better. It was just nice and uh, whatnot. But two down a river. Six years ago, I got married and we've done a lot of fun stuff. And we had children four years ago and four and we've done a lot of fun stuff in the past eight years. I can't imagine being bedridden eight years. Aeneas was. But Peter found him. Did you notice that? I'm not even in X9, I'm in X1. Do you notice that in verse 33, it says, there he found, Peter found him. He was going about his life as an apostle, preaching the gospel and visiting and overseeing and pastoring disciples. He was just obeying Jesus. He, as verse 31 said, prior to this account, he was with the disciples, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. He was being edified with the church. He was just living according to Christ's words in fellowship with Christ's followers. He was going about his life for Jesus and just came across this paralyzed man. You can't beat that. You can't beat running into somebody you know because of a, because of an encounter at, at a business in the community and then you happen to run into them when your church does a canvassing thing. That happened yesterday. You can't beat things that happen in the normal course of life. We, tr- we can strategize and we can plan or, or, or we can do this. We can just follow Jesus. We can just obey Jesus. We can just ask God, give me opportunities, connect my life with other people who need you. And he does a lot better job of helping us just find people than we could ever do. It's amazing. We can't assume Aeneas was a disciple. The text doesn't say, and we don't know how Peter found him or where he found him. But we do know he found him and spoke Jesus' name to him. You can see Aeneas just laying there on the ground. And Peter comes to him and he says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes you whole. There's this name you got to hear, Jesus Christ, and he makes you whole. He's a real person and he's healing you. So why don't you get up and make your bed, tidy your little mat here, make your bed. And immediately he got up and it says that everybody that dwelt in those areas, they saw him and turned to the Lord. This miracle impacted all those areas. All that lived in that town in that region saw Aeneas and they turned to the Lord. So what, what happened? What happened here? Peter just followed Jesus. He did what Christ wanted him to do. He found this paralytic. He spoke Jesus' name. He told the man what he had heard Jesus tell a paralyzed man. Remember, Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Uh Uh-oh, we're about to blow your mind. This is blowing my mind. Jesus called Peter to follow him. Hey, listen, you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. And Peter was there when, we read it this morning, Matthew 9, when a paralyzed man was brought to Jesus, and Jesus said, arise, take up your bed, and walk. Peter got to see Jesus do the very things that Jesus would later send him out to do. And, and that should, listen, that should assure you. I'm not so sure about me. I feel like a, a fisherman, a blue collar, a, nobody who, who often sticks my foot in my mouth like Peter. But all you got to do is follow Jesus. He'll make you a fisherman. You might not be able to get anybody to take up their bed and walk, but you can do what Jesus would have you to do, what Jesus has discipled you to do. And hear me. Jesus' name made all the difference. And all who saw the healed man had a turning to the Lord. You know what? Jesus was enough in the sickness of this bedridden man. 
Here was this former fisherman made fisher of men, just doing what Jesus empowered, commanded, sent him to do. He even did it similarly to how he saw Jesus do it. He took what he had. The name and presence and power of Jesus Christ. And he saw Jesus change a man's life and the lives of all that community. Jesus was enough. You say, well, I'm not Peter. I'm not an apostle. Sure, you're not. But can I ask you? Do you know Jesus? Has he called you to follow him? Aren't you on his mission in your daily life too? Can't you speak the name of the great physician to people you come across? Couldn't Jesus make people whole you come in contact with? I'm not saying you're going to people that are sick and saying, Hey, Jesus Christ makes you whole. You better be careful with that. You might, cash, you might write a check that can't be cashed. Now, I'm not saying Jesus couldn't do something like that. Believe that up to Jesus. They need to hear about the name of Jesus. But couldn't communities turn to him because you speak their name? He's still the same Jesus. And if you're his disciple, his name is to be on your lips and he can work powerfully in people's lives. Does his name ever come out of your mouth at work? In your family? You know it comes out of other people's mouths, but negatively, what about yours? And you know it. Even if folks who yesterday received the good news of Jesus Christ on their door have sicknesses that we can't cure, aren't their lives potentially eternally changed and made whole because of Jesus? Don't we believe that's true? See, in sickness, Jesus is still enough. Yet this message is about more than just sickness. It's about death because we saw that Peter was called to the deathbed of a godly disciple named Tabitha. Now, Tabitha lived in Joppa, which was on the Mediterranean coast, west of Lydda. Her Greek name, we saw, was Dorcas. And what Tabitha means in Aramaic, and Dorcas means in Greek, is the same thing, gazelle. Gazelle. And so, in other words, it's like her life was lively as a gazelle. Lively as a gazelle. Because you look at the end of verse, uh, let's see, 36. It says, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. She was full of good works. She was full of good deeds for the poor. That's alms deeds. And I believe that both names were recorded because she was known in Joppa by many people who both spoke her native tongue and called her Tabitha, but also spoke the language of the, the markets of that time and called her Dorcas, the Mediterranean market language. And it, it didn't matter who a person was or what language they spoke. Tabitha was a disciple whose good works were salt and light to them and glorified her father in heaven. We can have an influence on people whose language we don't even speak. I don't know if that was the case with Tabitha. We have these Hispanic guys who come and they're doing a great job cutting the grass. Well, we'd like to either have them up to our house or maybe take them. To, I'd like to take them down the road to Petrie City and have some authentic Hispanic food at La, what is it, La Mexicana down in Petrie City. Close. All right, and do something like that. You don't, we, we can barely understand each other, but you don't know what Jesus can do in a person's life if you're just willing to do good works. There was a Hispanic, I was driving up Fisher Road one day. There was this Hispanic man who was walking, he was walking back home all the way in Peachtree City from a job. I have no idea, but he's coming down the long haul from, I'm talking north of Sam's Club and all that, down Fisher. And I, so I pulled in there and I picked him up and I had some hot dogs there and uh, I was I wanted to eat him, but he looked like he needed help. And so I picked him up and I ran him back to his house and and the more I, we barely understood he that, each other but turns out he was a christian goes to some baptist church spanish ministry in peachtree city but when i got into his house he, he said wait don't eat the hot dog wait and he took me and introduced me to la mexicana so listen it doesn't matter what kind of people we run into if we just be like jesus and do good works you never know what kind of influence what kind of a relationship what kind of a connection god will give you to somebody else you can be learning spanish on duolingo and trying to talk to spanish and your daughter can be making fun of you but you can still make a connection with other people some of you won't make that connection but that's okay <clears throat> no sabe but it just so happened in these days that peter was in lydda that that wonderful lady Tabitha became sick and died. Wonderful lady, gone. 
Those about her washed her body according to Jewish purification laws. They laid her in a bed in an upstairs area. By this time, remember, Lydda, Joppa, Saren, the plain, between the two. The word had spread about that healing this way, so the disciples over here heard about Peter being there. Sent two men. They went and they got Peter. And he rose and came with them to Joppa. And you can just picture the scene. There they are in this upper room. And here is this, this wonderful, godly, dead woman. And, and in that upper room with them are all these widows who are weeping and mourning. And they're showing. They're showing Peter. These are poor widows who have no one to care for them. Who, who Dorcas... They called her Dorcas. These were likely Greek-speaking widows, people who she... It, it's a possibility, her, her Hebrew name being Tabitha, it's a possibility when persecution happened in Jerusalem that she was one who was scattered. So she was... It could have been she was out of a home. It could have been that those circumstances uprooted her, uprooted her and moved her as a single lady, it seems, herself, who's taking care of her. But she bloomed where she was planted. She bloomed where God relocated her if that was the case and all these Grecian widows were weeping and showing Peter look what she meant to us look what she meant to us we could say the very thing is this very same thing about a godly woman couldn't we look what she meant to us and there she was and Peter as he saw again as he saw Jesus do before you can go read about it in Mark chapter 5 verse, the, verse 30's into the 40s. When Jesus healed, he raised that 12-year-old girl from the dead. Before he did that, he put everybody out of the room. Peter did that, and it says he kneeled down. You read about Elijah and Elisha kneeling down and praying over a dead body of an individual. And Peter kneeled down and he prayed. And then he got up and he stood here and he said, Tabitha, arise. Or, or in, the, in the language, in the Hebrew language, it's Tabitha Kumai. When Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, the commentators get a kick out of this. There's one letter difference. He called her Talitha, which is a maid. Talitha Kumai, Talitha arise. And here Peter, getting to do what his Lord empowered him to do, he's saying, Tabitha Kumai, Tabitha arise. And immediately she opened her eyes and the first person she saw was Peter. And thankfully she knew who he was. And he took her by the hand and she got up and he, he hollered out the door and said, Hey y'all, come back in here and see Tabitha. And so he presented her to the saints and he presented her to the widows alive. And, and, and the word spread all throughout Joppa. And it says many believed in the Lord. What happened? Peter again did what Jesus empowered, commanded, and sent him to do. You go back and read Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. And you, say God, you see that Jesus gave the apostles power over all kinds of sicknesses and diseases to heal them. And verse number 7, he said, go and preach the gospel. And verse number 8, he said, heal the sick, raise the dead. Peter was only doing what Jesus had told him to do. And he again did something He, in a similar way he watched Jesus do. In other words, in death. Jesus was still enough. Peter knew who could raise the dead. Peter was gifted power to do the same in Jesus' name. I wish I had that power. I really, really do. But he took what Jesus gave him and saw Jesus work to turn many of a mixed community who had not heard the name of Jesus to belief in Jesus Christ. In death, Jesus was enough. Watch this. God used the life of Dorcas, Tabitha, but God used the death of Dorcas even more. See, disciples who live the Sermon on the Mount are greatly missed when they die. Aren't they? Their death is so impactful for Jesus' name and his mission. Here's why. Because their life was so impactful as they followed the teachings of Jesus Christ. And you may not be a Peter, and Dorcas wasn't either, but she was this. She was a God-fearing, Christ-following woman full of good works and actions for people in need. Her life spread the name of Jesus. Her death spread the name of Jesus. Her raising up spread the name of Jesus. And I wouldn't go too far to say that her eventual death again spread the name of Jesus. Surely she was a disciple in touch with the needy of her community. And in her death, Jesus was enough. Let me ask you. 
What other name will you call on when you are sick and dying? Buddha? Muhammad? What other name will you speak to sick and dying people? What name will people remember because of your life and death? If you will follow Jesus, if you will fear God, if you will walk in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, if you will fill your life, disciple, with good works and kindness to poor and needy people, whether you suffer sickness and face death or you ache for others in similar circumstances, Jesus is still enough. Let's pray.